second thing, uh, you need to get seven to nine hours of sleep. Now, people are a little bit different. Sometimes, as you get older, you don't need quite as much. But it's not at all uncommon for people who don't feel good to report that they're sleeping badly. And that's kind of another one of these vicious circles. The lousier we sleep, the more likely we are to feel stressed, and in turn, the more stress, harder to sleep. So just a couple quick reminders. You want the room to be cool, dark, and quiet. And you need to have some kind of a go-to thing to do if you wake up in the middle of the night because you're worried. And I just give you my two favorites. I wake up at 2 o'clock in the morning because things ain't going right, which happens every now and then. I got my go-tos. Here's my first go-to, which you've heard a zillion times, but it's the truth. When I get up in the middle of the night, I meditate. I go someplace. I don't lay in bed and toss and turn because laying in bed and toss and turn is going to screw you up worse. You get up out of bed, you go someplace else, you sit down and you do some kind of a settle yourself down through meditation activity. And the second thing, which is written on the sheet, you don't have to remember all of it, but the second thing I do after I get done with my meditation is I do what I call a three column technique. And I'll touch on it now and I'll develop it a little bit more in a few minutes. So here's our three column technique. Challenge, automatic thought, rational response. Challenge, the bills. Automatic thought, ah, I'm screwed. Okay, rational response. Now wait a minute, wait a minute. I don't want to make things worse or double down and screwing it up. So if I don't have the money to pay, and there's and it's someone with whom I can actually have a conversation, I'm going to try to have a conversation and say, here's my deal, here's what I can do, here's what I can't do, let's talk. And it's just an example. Okay? So challenge the bills, automatic thought, ah, rational response. Can I negotiate with somebody and, uh, and go towards what I'm afraid of? <coughs> Something that happens to us when we get scared is we tend to want to argue, get irritable and short-tempered, run away, you know, not talk to anybody. Third thing we're, tem we're tempted to do is freeze up. We just kind of want to sit in a chair and do nothing. The last thing we're tempted to do when we're stressed is fog up. Fog up is use drugs or alcohol, including prescription drugs. So when we get stressed, we're tempted to run away, freeze up, Fog up. Uh, argue, run away, freeze up, and fog up. Okay? Argue, run away, freeze up, and fog up. Now, so, big four nutrition, hydration, sleep. Third thing, exercise. Now, a lot of you guys get plenty of exercise in the field. I mean, I'm not trying to tell you how to run your laps. Okay? But I will say this getting exercise is different, for instance, than your work in the field. Because what we're shooting for when I'm talking about exercise is can we, for example, go someplace that's pleasant and go for a walk outside? Okay. Now, the weather won't be ideal for that in another two months, but right now it's perfect. And I, I mean, I grew up over by Tyro Park, so hey, it's Tyro Park, beautiful place to go. We'll cruise around that inside uh, pathway in there. It's a, it's a gorgeous place, it's a beautiful place to be. It's the kind of thing that's going to help reduce your stress level. Okay, so exercise. Enough cannot be said about exercise. Give an example of how powerful exercise. And by the way, when I say about exercise or fitness, I'm talking about three or four things. I'm talking about aerobic conditioning. That's where you do the walking thing, make your heart beat faster. The second thing is being stretchy, so being flexible. So you got to be able to do some kind of uh, stretchy stuff. You know, like you do stuff like that, and stuff like that, touch your toes. So, you need aerobic conditioning, you need to be flexible. The thing you need is strength. Strength. I just read a study today, a fascinating study, where they worked with women who were between 65 and 75, and they showed in the study that people that lift weights twice a week actually will stop their brains from deteriorating. These are 65, 75-year-old women, and their brains aren't working right or as good as they could, and if they lift, twice a week, the what are called white matter lesions will actually stop developing in their brains, and in some cases reverse. Kind of crazy, kind of wild, but at the same time, kind of makes sense. So you want to be, uh, so you want to be able to be strong heart, flexible, push weight around, and the other one is have some balance. So those are exercise goals. So nutrition, hydration, sleep, exercise, and the last one, socialize. 
socialized, hey, we all are shooting for having a friend. Let me tell you something about friendship. I have a group of guys that I've been getting together with once a month to talk and have dinner uh, since 1972. So when we get together, uh, by God's good grace, we know each other pretty well. So, you know, everybody's full of bullshit to some extent. But, uh, but as a general rule, when we talk, uh, there's some heart exchange to it. So there's people in my life, and I would include Joe among these people. These are people I consider my friends. And I try to cultivate those friendships. I'm going to tell you two things about friendship that are really important to me. Uh, it may not be the kind of thing you normally think of. There are these. The first thing is, friendship is knowing how to take turns in a conversation. So that means you get to talk, and the other person gets to talk. So it's not just one way. It's not just, you know, I sit and the other person goes. Or I just go, and the other person has to sit. It's taking turns. So it's taking turns talking and listening. That's the number one ingredient in having a friendship, is being able to take turns in a conversation. The other key ingredient in having a friendship is, uh, I used to say it, uh, being comfortable with each other's neuroses. So, hey, a friendship is being with somebody who knows that I am a screwed up mess and is okay with that. And I know they're a screwed up mess and I'm okay with their screwed up mess. So you got those two things. You know how to take turns in the conversation, and both parties know that they're screwed up. It doesn't work if you think you've got it going, and you're thinking they ain't got it going. That's not how you keep the friendship. Got it? Makes sense, right? Yep. Yeah, this guy, what's wrong with him? Instead of going, as, as the scriptures say, you know, plank in your own eye, splinter in the other person's eye. So you got to get that stuff straight, or it's going to be a mess. Okay, so now we got our big four. I call them the big four because it's hard to get your life really back on course if you're not paying attention to the big four. Future generation, sleep, exercise, socialize. Okay. Now we get over into the kind of psychological and spiritual stuff. And it starts with one that I'll say a few things about and then we can do some practicing. Um, and I have to pay attention to it because it's just that important. So the first thing I talk about when it comes to the cycle spiritual growth is posture and breathing. Okay? And I'll say something about posture. Uh, when we're having a hard time, it's very tempting to fall into what I call threat postures. Threat postures are when we're doing stuff kind of like this. And it's kind of subtle, but think about the times when you're sitting around and you're worrying and you start to kind of scrunch. The problem with the scrunching is that you accidentally are sending a message to your body or throughout your body that you're actually under threat. So your body, it goes, uh, mind is connected to body and body is connected to mind. So this one's body connected to mind. If there's something happening physically with you and you're not paying close enough attention to it, you may inadvertently start your mind to going, What's wrong? What's wrong? What's wrong? So one of the easiest things to do to make things go better is correct your posture. So posture correction is basically shoulders down and back, head up, eyes at the horizon line, and that's way different than very subtle, sometimes very pronounced scrunching. So de-scrunch, everybody, when you're trying to chill and have a better space to be in psychologically and spiritually. Shoulders down and back, head up, eyes at the horizon line. So Get your posture straight. And then the second thing, as I said, we'll linger on this one for a while, is breathing. Now, two types of breathing. The second one will uh, riff off into meditation stuff. So here's the first type of breathing. First of all, what happens when we're not breathing right? There's two types of threat breathing. The first type of threat breathing, this is something that, that actors, I am told, which I might be able to corroborate this, actors, I am told, are taught this technique. And that's breathing high in your chest with your mouth open. So if you're a method actor and they're trying to get you to act out a scene where you're scared or angry, they might ask you to do that for a moment because it kind of changes the way your body operates. So watch yourselves when you're breathing high in your chest, you're more likely to be feeling stressed or scared or angry. Okay. 
So it's something you can, if you notice it, you can do something about it. So that's the first type of direct breathing. The second type of direct breathing is that everybody knows how this goes. You're just kind of plodding along and all of a sudden, big sigh. I know, I mean, well, maybe you guys, none of you guys probably have ever sighed, right? <laughs> <laughs> like big sigh. That's another example of threat breathing. So we're going through our day and stuff's starting to wear us down and all of a sudden we're like, okay, so that's, what's going on there is we forgot to breathe. So we're worrying and thinking and worrying and then all of a sudden our body's going, where's the oxygen? So we'll, and we'll go back to worrying and thinking and worrying and thinking some more. So if you notice that you're breathing high in your chest, well, pardon me if you notice that you're uh, um, holding your breath inside, those are two signals that you need to make some corrections. So here, first audience participation thing here, coming up. So two types of improving your breathing. Here's the first one. So just watch what I do for a second, and maybe we can do it together for a moment. So I'm going to make my tummy push out. Watch, breathe in and out through my nose. Watch my stomach, my lower hand. <coughs> Mm -hmm. So my upper chest isn't really moving much. My shoulder's not moving much, right? My tummy's pushing out. But this is the way a baby breathes when it's taking a nap. Now, it goes faster because the baby's heart beat faster than an adult. But they're real low down there. It looks like something's going on in their tummy. Uh, what's going on there is there's, a, there's a, a muscle called your diaphragm muscle that kind of cuts up there. When that di diaphragm muscle expands, it contracts it so it pushes your tummy out. But when you're relaxed, that's the way, one of the ways that you breathe is nice and low down there. Now, nice thing about uh, body being connected to the mind is if you just on your own start up breathing that way, your mind's going to start going, okay, maybe things aren't as screwed up as I was worried. So, and the way I have it on the handout is at the top of every hour, so 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, I get to ask myself, am I breathing or holding my breath? So if I'm holding my breath, I'm going to be screwed up. So I can take a minute, nobody's going to know, not a tip on you guys so you can be watching each other, wow, what are you doing, something weird, like that Dr. Pat said, that's weird. But it's all on uh, you on your own time, if you're so inclined, diaphragm, like yeah, I, you know, in and out through your nose. And it's very likely to help you either calm down, get yourself down below a five on that scale from one to ten, or if you're already chill, it can keep you down there, even if you're in a, uh, a challenging situation. Okay. All right, so I've been barraging you with information. Comments, questions, observations, how are we doing today? Have I ruined your day yet? No. Oh, I wasn't trying to ruin you. <laughs> You know, uh, I have a lot of sweaty palms all the time, and I be trying to figure out why my palms be so sweaty. Yeah. You know, so it's tension there. That is a very reasonable assumption. I can't say yeah, that it's 100%, yeah. but that's a pretty reasonable assumption to make that a lot of it is feeling stressed. Yep. yep. Other observations, comments, or questions? Yes, sir. How if it's uh, when you dream and wake, wake you up, by the way? What do you do if you have a dream that wakes you up? Yeah, no, I mean, uh, when you go to sleep and then you uh, suddenly you, you have a dream. Yes. And then wake you up. Okay, so the dream wakes you up? Yeah. And is it a scary dream? No, no, not scary. Sometimes it's funny, sometimes it's uh, uh, romantic. <laughs> Enjoy it! <laughs> Believe it or not, this morning, this morning I slept only one hour. I was dreaming, I, I dream about, I think, a Hillary Clinton. <laughs> <laughs> she was strong, everything. You were taking care of her? Yeah, I was taking care of her. <laughs> <laughs>
He's going to be sleeping with me a week from tonight in Kansas City. We're going to have a lot of romantic dreams. I'll mistake him for a pillow. Okay. So this is true. I mean, it's a little bit dream. But for me, it's easy to go sleep. I, I just one minute I, could, I, I couldn't sleep, and then I dream right away. It don't take me long to get dreams. Yeah, he sleeps on the floor right here, just like that. And then I wake up anywhere. Dream. Some, I don't know why. Lately, I mean, start from this year. Mm -hmm. No, no, happened before. I guess you think that it's my age. So then what's the question? Did you want him, say, to meditate then or what? What were you thinking? Uh, my question was, uh, why, why make me, uh, yep. make me up like that? Yeah. Right. Uh, it is true that as we age, we don't spend, it, we don't get, go crazy on the, on the sleep thing, but uh, goes, there's three sleep stages and then there's the rapid eye movement thing. So, so stage three is the deep dreamless sleep. That's when you get the most rest. And then there's that stage we call REM, rapid eye movement or dreaming sleep. So uh, our goal is to get relaxed enough before we go to bed to, uh, to get to stage three in REM sleep. And what I always say about being awakened is uh, I don't jump right out of bed. And by the way, clock watching is not a good idea. So don't watch the clock. Judge best you can whether over the period of 10, 15 minutes you fall back to sleep. What you don't want is to be laying in bed or wherever you are, tossing and turning. So if you're tossing and turning, that's a good reason to get up, meditate, and, and do that three column technique, okay? So if you can fall back asleep in 10, 15 minutes and you're in business, don't worry about it. Okay? All right, any other questions or comments? Yes, sir. So on, on that, you said uh, seven to nine hours of sleep. Yeah. But if your stress is causing you to wake up because you're not sleeping, and then you're, you're up, you got to get up and do your yes. relaxation. Then you're, you know, then you try to go back to sleep. You're only getting a couple hours sleep before right. you actually have to get up physically for work or whatever. Right. So how does right. that cycle um, stop? Good question. Um, here's the best advice. It really is the best advice. It's usually not a good idea to try to catch up with sleep by sleeping in. I'm not trying to be stupid about it. If it's you know Saturday morning or whatever, you don't have to work and you want to grab an extra hour or two. Be my guest. But as a general rule, it's not a good idea to try to catch up with sleep. And it's also not a good idea to take naps. It's almost like a paradox. If you want to sleep more deeply, it's okay to get robbed occasionally of enough sleep because that often means the next night or two, you'll sleep longer and more deeply. Okay? So that's the advice that experts would give. And I'm talking about the Mayo Clinic and what are called sleep medicine doctors. Try not to. And also, it's almost always a bad idea to take drugs or drink in hopes of, uh, I mean, if you drink, yourself. yeah, you're going to go to sleep, but it's going to be crappy sleep exactly. Right? So you don't want to do that. Okay, uh, so we keep cruising here. Here's what we want to do. I would like you for a moment to, and I'll tell you how to do it, and then we'll do it, and then we'll talk about it. So in a minute, I'm going to ask you to close your eyes and just swing to or switch to paying attention to the sensations of breathing in and breathing out. What does it feel like as you inhale and exhale? So in a minute, I'm going to have you close your eyes and just do that. You know, some of you might have allergies or something. You can't do it. All right, fine. But most of you, if you close your eyes, you can switch to paying attention to what it feels like. What are the sensations of breathing in and breathing out? And I'm going to ask you to do that. Okay? Okay, down with that all right, so close your eyes. I'm going to do it with you. And just notice what it feels like to breathe in and breathe out. attention to your in-breath and your out-breath and worrying. Either paying attention to your in-breath and your out-breath 
Or you're worrying. You can't do them both at the same time. Everybody got that? Okay, that is the key. Not the only, but it's a huge one. It's the key to meditation. You actually get a vacation from the shitstorm in your brain. So 10,000 thoughts a day, 98% of which are completely useless all day long, okay? So and when you do an activity like that one, you get a break from it, and that break can be so helpful in feeling better, so helpful. And we can't get too good at this. There's people that have spent decades practicing this kind of stuff, and they're still just as delighted to sit down and do it, you know, when they're 50, as when they were 13 or 15, okay? So, uh, so that's our go-to. And the nice thing about that, paying attention to in-breath, out-breath, is if you extend that just a little bit, you've got the beginnings of a very simple meditation practice. And I, again, I'm here to tell you, you want to know what I teach the clients I have and what I teach the medical doctors and have for 19 years? I teach them that. It's not some kind of fancy hocus pocus stuff, you know, like remember your toilet training, you know, when you're three and look into my eyes and spend golly and I'm gonna make you all well. That's ridiculous. Here's what's real. What's real is all of us have the power to take control of what we do with our mind. And it is our sanctuary, and no one can take that away from us. So as we learn how to master our minds and work with our distractions and work with our minds, we have a huge advantage, a huge advantage. And to be honest, not very many people are willing to take the time. And what I'm trying to sell you on today is it's not as hard as you might think it is. It could be a little bit easier than you think or you fear, okay? It could just be, here's the next thing coming up. If you take that pay attention to your in-breath and out-breath, and extend it in this way, and then we're going to spend a few minutes actually doing that, uh, it can be a real life changer for you. So here's a way that's been around for 900 years to do that. So if you, so in a minute we're going to do this little meditation thing, you're going to pay attention to your in-breath and your out-breath, and on the out-breath, you're going to count 10, in-breath, out-breath, 9, in breath, out breath, eight. You're gonna go down to one, and you're gonna start over again. Count each out breath, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. Got it? Okay, so I'm gonna sit down, and we're gonna to meditate together, and I'm gonna do just a couple revolutions with that. So two sets of 10, counting from 10 to one. And here's the, here's a very important thing to keep in mind. You're gonna be all the clips. You're going to be thinking about your dream last night. You know, you're going to be thinking about uh, work. You're going to be thinking about bills. You're going to be thinking about plans for the weekend. All you're trying to do as you are distracted, and you will be distracted again and again, is just keep going back to picking up your count and counting down. And if you're doing that, you're doing what everybody else in the universe is trying to do, which is work with their distracted mind. I've got a distracted mind. And everybody's got a distracted mind. Okay, so let's do it. And I'll give you a little more for you. Nobody can get it. You got it, you ain't got it. You cultivate it, you're going to be a better person. And you're going to have hope. You're going to have real possibilities for change. Okay, now, uh, two more things real quick. First one is, uh, ever been to a scary movie? Okay, so you're at a scary movie, you know, you got a Diet Coke and popcorn. Great combination, Diet Coke and popcorn. <laughs> and you walk into the screen. And the monster jumps out, he's going to eat the hero. So the monster jumps out, you're at the movies, what do you do when the monster jumps out? That's right, people go, they go like that, right? So you think about it, why do you do that? Why do you have a startle reflex at a freaking movie that you know you paid seven or eight bucks to get scared? Why do you do that? Right? That doesn't make any sense, does it? Your brain cannot tell the difference between image and reality. If you hold a disturbing image in your mind's eye, your body responds as if it's real. Okay? You hold a scary image, a disturbing image in your mind's eye, your body's going to respond like it's really happening, even though it's in your head. Just sir. Now, when I watch a movie like that at night, I'm 100% guaranteed to dream about that. 
that night. Oh yeah. You know, and I, you know, I won't watch no movies after a certain time. <laughs> I know scary movies. I know after a certain scary time, Yeah, at a certain time, like, I won't do it. I don't need it. I know as soon as I doze off, I don't see that. Yeah, I don't need it either. Yeah. <laughs> so, so here's the flip of that. The flip of that is if you hold hope-filled and positive images in your mind, then the more concrete, the better. Then your body changes as if it's real. Now, I'm going to give you a very concrete example of that. Uh, and this stuff is stuff you can look up if you're in the mood, you've got a computer and you're into Googling things, you can Google this. Um, what we know is that if you are, and you can be more than 40 years old, so this is not just for kids. If you're 40 years old and somebody tries to teach you how to play a fiddle or a violin, okay? And so you're trying to learn how to left, you know, usually left hand, work those frets and things and saw that thing over there. Yeah, you make those great noises if you can. Okay, it's quite a skill. So you can practice the violin. If you practice the violin for a period of weeks, now, and you did a little study of somebody's brain before the practice started, after they get done practicing, and you take another picture of that person's brain, the part of their brain that controls that left hand actually will have gotten bigger. So you actually grow your brain when you practice doing stuff. And the same thing works, by the way, just using your imagination. And again, all the research about that. If you just practice doing that without actually doing it, just in your mind's eye, that part of your brain would grow. Same thing is true of muscles, okay? So I know stuff is hard to believe, but I'll show you the research if you want to see it. And I'm surrounded by these medical doctors and all that. Where's that study? Where's the research? Show me, show me, show me. It's all out there, guys. It's all out there. Okay? So you want it to get into a better spot. You want to calm down. You want to feel more effective. You want to be more hopeful. Then you vividly imagine yourself getting to a better spot. And the better spot could just be, I didn't get as mad at my friend, or I didn't get as mad at my girlfriend, or my kid, or I didn't get as mad at, you know, whatever it is. The guy that was kind of leaning over in my lane when I was driving down Kirkwood Road. I just, you know, I'm, just, I'm chilling out, and I see in my mind's eye the possibility that I can get into a more chill space. And you see that in your mind's eye. You vividly hold that in your mind's eye. And like I said, the best time to do that is when you're like a two or a three. It's harder to do when you're a six or seven or eight on a scale of ten. But when you chill yourself out, you're more open to suggestion. That's why hypnosis works. You get somebody in a chill place, and then you make a suggestion or two to them, and they're a lot more receptive to this. So you can hypnotize yourself by doing that little meditation activity we talked about. Hypnotize yourself, and then vividly picture yourself handling a challenging situation more skillfully. A million bucks, it'll work. Okay, last thing, three column technique. Uh, so this is the capstone. Remember, you can change your mind about anything. You can change your mind about anything if you practice. I'll give you two kind of crazy examples. One of them comes from the Dalai Lama. The Dalai Lama is the leader of Tibetan Buddhism, he travels around the world and gives speeches and stuff. He's the Buddhist of Buddhists at the moment. This is one of his most interesting stories. He talks about, so he escaped from China, from Tibet in 1959, and a lot of these Tibetan monks didn't make it. A lot of them got shot, killed on the spot. A lot of them got put in jail. This guy got, this monk that was one of the Dalai Lama's teachers was in a concentration camp held by the Chinese communists for 19 years. Eventually he got out of the concentration camp, he escaped over the Himalayas into northern India where the Dalai Lama hangs out now, and they met up again. And so this was the conversation that the Dalai Lama reported. So, you know, what's, what happened? And this monk says, well, you know, I made it out of there. So the Dalai Lama says, how are you doing? And the guy says, well, I'm doing fine, although two times I was in danger. And the Dalai Lama goes, you mean you almost died twice? And the monk goes, no. Two times I almost lost my compassion for the Chinese while I was in that concentration camp for 19. Two, two times I was really in danger. I almost lost my compassion for the Chinese. Okay? So you can change your mind about anything. But it works better when you get yourself consistently in a more chill spot. That's how you do your meditation, get yourself calm down. Things are easier to see in your mind's eye, easier to think about. So final thing, challenge, automatic thought, rational spot. Take a piece of paper off your columns. Challenge, automatic thought, rational spot. So when you're in a chill spot, you work on something. So challenge, my girlfriend, automatic thought, ah, rational
rational response. I think things could go better if I was able to be more complimentary of her or if I practiced listening to her. So, and here's how you listen. Eye contact, smile, and nod. <laughs> That's how you listen. Eye contact, smile, and nod. Okay. And then you get more back from somebody. Okay, I've been talking a lot. Comments, questions, observations. How are we doing today? Comments, questions, observations. Yes, sir. Good question. Uh, nutrition. Yes, sir. Uh, now you're speaking on in terms of carbohydrates. Yes. Now, is there something that you can that's easily read about, read, uh, ready that tastes good? That you <laughs> substitute. <laughs> that's a great question. That's a great question. It, it depends. But um, I would eat broccoli sprouts. I'm with you. <laughs> so, so we're not looking for perfection. We're just looking for a slight improvement. That's what we call a lower glycemic index. You know, too much right. stuff. But uh, an apple, an apple actually has a, low, a lower glycemic index to it. So, and, and you can try and shop around. You can get a particular type of apple that you like. It's got some sweetness to it. It's got some fiber in it, and it's an example of something that could taste good as a snack. Thing. Make sense? Here's one I kind of discovered again. I bought, I bought them at Walmart. I bought, uh, it's just called sharp cheddar cheese. I bought almost like a block of it, and it's sliced. Right. And I found that that's actually pretty good. So, so sharp cheddar cheese, it's, uh, uh, it's a dairy product, I understand that. But it's not loaded with carbs, and it's got some nutritional support that comes from it. And so, make it sense? Thanks. Okay, yeah. And you just, what we're trying to do is avoid doing the totally crazy stuff. So the totally crazy stuff <coughs> is fries oh, and uh, a Coke, you know, a regular uh, Coke made out of cane sugar or corn syrup solids. Those are the really tough ones on our body over a long period of time. So just kind of steering away from those two things, just those two things. Like, go ahead, I'm, I'm keeping it real. If you want to eat, yo, go ahead and have the, check it out. The double, because they're not very expensive, uh, the double cheeseburger with McDonald's and a, uh, a Diet Coke is way better than a couple of regular hamburgers, because you got all the extra buns, and the fries and the bad Coke. That's a, it's a big difference. It's a big swing in the amount of carbohydrates. So the double cheeseburger and a Diet Coke is way better than, making sense? Okay. okay. And, it's, and that's a pretty inexpensive snack. You know, you can get that for two, two and a quarter, you know, the time. And I know, because I do it. <laughs> <laughs> price is right. Yeah. Right close by, price is right. Other questions, comments, or observations? Okay. You do meditation 7 o'clock every Thursday. Yes, every Thursday. A bunch of us showed up, would you scream? No. <laughs> no, you'd be welcome. How long do you meditate? Uh, Every day, minimum I get is about 35 minutes. What's the longest you ever do? Uh, great question. I'm going to go back someplace where I'm going to spend most of my day doing it. But longest periods would be uh, would have been about five and a half or six hours a day. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, and I will tell you this, and I appreciate you asking. I can tell you that the, some of the best I've ever felt in my life came after spending about a week. Spending about five and a half or six hours a day meditating. Oh, next question. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Because you get yourself in a different spot. Because remember, the goal of advertising is to keep you all jacked up all the time because you're easier to control when you're all jacked up. So when you get away from the radio and the TV, when it's just, you know, well, it's just a week, it's just a week out of your life, when you take a real vacation from it makes a huge difference in the way your brain operates, and often people feel way better. Way better. But good question. What else? What else? Other questions or comments? Yes, sir. It's, well, like me, uh, I got a bad habit when I go home. Instead of, well, I don't meditate that often. Turning my TV on, it seems like that's a medication to me. I mean, it was like therapy or something. And it stays on. If I'm home all night, that TV will stay on all night. But if I try to shut it off, I can lay there in the bed and make five or ten minutes and I cannot doze off for nothing in the world. Right. So I'm trying to see, is there anything I could do? Maybe I meditate before 
I lay down. Yeah, maybe that help. Absolutely. You know, um, but what I think about that is we all get uh, attached to things. We all get attached to all kinds of stuff. All kinds of stuff. So sometimes the way to change it is to break it down little by little. So for example, mm -hmm. if you made a deal with yourself that I'm going to uh, wait five minutes first day, and then maybe 10 minutes the second day, and then maybe 15 minutes the third day, just wait a few minutes before you turn it off. It's possible that if you did that by day five or six, you might not even turn it on at all for the, next, for the first couple hours. Mm -hmm. So it's like break it into smaller parts. So if, if, if you're trying to make a change, the change has got to be important to you, and you have to have confidence that you can do it. So a lot of people know something's important. Like they'll, they'll hear me talk about meditation and go, that sounds like a really good idea. I think that could be important for me. In fact, I think it's important for me. Back to my scales from one to 10, we'll flip this one. So it's a nine. You know, I gotta do this. This is, my life depends on getting this. But the confidence might not be there. Your confidence might only be a four or five. The way to build confidence is to break it into smaller parts. So if you can't do it for five hours, maybe you do it for five minutes. And then you start there. Okay. Yeah.